Good morning everybody. Hope you all are doing well on this beautiful morning. It's a wonderful morning to enjoy God's creation with my closest friends behind me. I want to welcome you to Grace Church. Thanks for joining us and we're really glad you're here. Please have your elements ready for communion. Really anything will work. Some bread and wine or juice or coffee or anything that will serve as a representation during communion this morning. And um, feel free to type in comments during the service. We're continuing the virtual services uh, with Grace. So we love to, to hear from you all in the comments during uh, Sunday morning as well. And please check out the online learning guide to uh, learn more information and ways to dig in deeper into the message that will be shared. Um, love you guys so much and please remember that uh, we have a God that loves and knows us deeply. Hey, good morning, Grace Church. Good to see y'all, see y'all, or just acknowledge that we are doing the same thing at the same time because I'm not really seeing you because this is pre-recorded. Whatever, man. Um, I, I miss y'all a ton. Um, I'm here today beside my favorite tree and the sunshine and the birds and the cars occasionally driving by. So there's that noise in the background. I um, am excited to lead y'all in some worship this morning. So do whatever is most worshipful for you at home. Um, sing, stand, sit, dance. Um, uh, we're going to worship together. So let me pray real quick and we'll get started. So God, thank you. Um, thank you for Grace Church. Thank you um, for our little community that you brought together. Um, this ragtag group of people who love Jesus and I'm really grateful to be a part of this. Um, I got to pray that today you would, um, I don't know, you would just lead us and you would guide us and you would move us to action. Um, that it wouldn't just be something we hear, but it would be something we respond to and and do. So, I love you. Um, in your name we pray. Amen. Bye. 
Morning, everybody. Really glad to see you here this morning. Get the sound right here. How's everybody? Wish I could see your faces. So, if you've lived here in Fayetteville for a while, you know that the Ozark National Forest does these controlled burns. But it took a while before I realized what was going on. Before I got the the memo of what was happening with that. And as the smoke descended, you know, it kind of covered everything like a blanket. And I quickly thought, well, what's happening? And then I heard on the radio, hey, don't be alarmed. This is a controlled burn. And they do these burns for a very good reason. It's part of good forest management. What they do is they go in and they burn out the accumulated clutter, the accumulated debris that builds up over years and actually prevents the new forest from growing up. It prevents the forest from flourishing. And not only does it suppress new growth, but it threatens the historical um, the good growth, the, the mature trees, because if it grows up too much, eventually it will catch fire. We know that. Lightning will strike, something will happen. And if it's accumulated for too many years, that fire will then destroy the established trees, as well as um, the burning out the brush underneath. Well, it's one thing to be told not to worry, when we smell the smoke and we see it descending. It's another thing to resist that natural urge, that good urge to put the fire out with that. We all have that, that's not a bad urge. People were more than nervous when Paul and Silas and their crew came to town. In fact, they got downright riotous. See, this group of first Christian missionaries was going about setting fires everywhere they went. They would roll into town, preach like lightning, and the Holy Spirit would inflame people's hearts. But those who smelled the smoke and didn't understand what was going would quickly go to put the sparks out. No matter how many times, though, this band of believers was run out of town, they had matches ready for the next stand of wood. This week, we're going to look at three incidents where this happened. Um, while some seem similar on the surface, each has its own story with this. So pray with me as we start. God, please open our hearts to receive your word today. Create in us a holy and good imagination that receives the fire of the Holy Spirit to burn away, which is suppressing growth and to keep us open to the new opportunities you lay before us. Bless our church. Wherever we're gathered today, Fayetteville, Northwest Arkansas, Portland, wherever, God, do your thing in us, among us, and through us. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. The gospel is like this fire that spreads wherever the churches go, wherever the church goes, or at least it's supposed to. And it does this in a variety of contexts. And I think you'll see this as you read the text this week. So we're going to take a moment here and read the text where you are. I encourage you to read it out loud. If, uh, if you're gathered with other people, take turns reading that. But, but read it out loud. And as you do, let the words settle in and um, start 
turning things up in your imagination. Then we'll come back and make a few observations about it.
Last week, we talked about how it's not so much the church of God that has a mission, but the God of mission that has a church. Um, this week, as you read, and as we all read together just now, this mission is continuing to be lived out by Paul and the others who are going all over spreading the good news, the gospel as it goes. And there's some really interesting things going on that I want to call our attention to. Uh, the first is Paul and Silas in Thessalonica. Um, man, this this just blows up kind of from the start. They go as they do. They, they, they go to speak among the Jewish believers there and the Gentile God-fearers, the, the Gentiles who are interested and in starting to participate in the life of the Jewish community uh, in very, at various levels in various ways. And uh, man, they just start off a riot. And one of the really interesting characters here is Jason. Um, we, we guess that Jason was one of those first converts. And in just a matter of weeks, he's thrust into this position of leadership. And then he's the one who they take before the council. I read this and I just think, man, have you ever been in that position? Put in a situation you're totally overwhelmed by, that you never imagined, that you feel totally unqualified for. Here, Jason is being put on trial, called to give an answer for what's going on. And he, he's only been a convert maybe a week, maybe two weeks, three at the most. And he's, and he's even though he's identified later in Romans, uh, I think it's Romans 16, Paul calls him a fellow countryman. So he, he came from the Jewish faith. He was probably a Jew living in the diaspora there. The whole meaning of Jesus was still days old to him. Sometimes life is just like that, right? We're thrust into something we don't understand, may never fully understand in this life. But that's no excuse not to respond. That's no excuse to sit back and disavow what we have. Sometimes we're given a long time to understand and then adjust, and other times we have to adjust in the moment feels like instantaneously we have to take responsibility for something new and to change. And that's kind of the story that emerges from Thessalonica. Well, as we read, they, they quickly shuttle Paul and Silas off to this town called Berea. Uh, if you grew up in the South, chances are driving through little towns, you would see a Berean Baptist church or a Berean Thess uh, Presbyterian church because of the reputation that we read there, that they took seriously the word, that they studied it for themselves. And that's always been held up as an example of how to respond. And that's another way that the truth comes to us, right? Is sometimes there are those times where we can sit with a group and reason things out and talk rationally about them and go back and look and examine where God has put his signpost and markers in our tradition. And we can bring those things forth out of our tradition. So things go pretty well for them in Berea and until the fire that they started in Thessalonica reaches out to them. And then we don't know why, but Paul was sent off to Athens on his own here. And this is where, this is where it's really interesting to me. We talked a lot about this in the teaching team this week. Um, Paul goes into Athens, and this is where East and West really collide. The Judeo um, tradition colliding with the Hellenist tradition in the Greek homeland. Um, Ryan Jackson did a marvelous video this week. It's in the learning guide. We sent it out in the email yesterday. Um, bonus points if you're having to homeschool your kids about world history, Ryan did your job for you this week. It's awesome. So I want to encourage you to look into that and, uh, and to see what's going on here. Um, and this is one of those really interesting biblical passages. It's kind of like in theater where I feel like an actor breaks the fourth wall, where you're watching, where you're watching theater, you're watching a movie, and then all of a sudden the actor turns towards the camera and starts talking directly to you. That's kind of what that feels like here, because what we see is an intersection of biblical history and world history. Now, I'm not saying one is better than the other. They, they both serve their purposes. 
Um, but most of when we read the Bible, we're immersed in biblical history, which has a very specific point of view, a very specific emphasis, a very specific message to go. And we think of world history, the, the kind of history we study in, in school, as something totally different. Well, here those two things interact. We get this biblical character coming onto the stage in this very worldly setting for world history that, as Ryan comments in his video, is so important to the development of culture and, and all of world history with that. Um, in a way, it's kind of like when they mash up Marvel characters from the Marvel universe and the DC universe, and you see, uh, you know, you see the the X Men uh, fighting along with Superman, or you know, Batman becomes an Avenger. Like it, it, you know, they're both in the same world in a way, but they have very different storylines. They seem totally separate. So here we have Paul coming into this coming onto the stage here um, in this place in, a in Athens. And he presents his message very differently than he does with the Jews. Or, or really not that different in the sense that when he's presenting to the Jews, he's always going back to Scripture. He's always going back to their tradition. He's always quoting the prophets. And he kind of adopts that same tact here, only they don't have a Bible per se or the Torah, like the Jews did, but they have their philosophers. They have their history, and he quotes extensively from them. But what he doesn't do is compromise the message, even though he addresses them in a language and in a way and through a history and a culture that they have. It all comes back to Jesus. It all comes back to the resurrection, the call to repentance, the one God, the God who is creator and sustainer of all things, the God who has been working even when they didn't recognize God. God has been there with that. And that brings us to a really interesting point about what we mean when we say gospel. Um, one of the themes that's been emerging in our teaching team as we meet each morning or each week on Tuesday mornings is uh, how do we define gospel? We like to think that there's just one monolithic understanding of the gospel. But what we see is that the gospel is incredibly adaptable. As a matter of fact, the gospel has to be with that. In the commentary this week, I was struck by one of the authors who said this. He said, um, the gospel does not exist in some un unadulterated form and isolation, apart from human language, culture, or presuppositions. It's always enfleshed in some way, linguistically, culturally, personally. How would we understand it or recognize it as good news if it weren't? And ultimately, we see this in Jesus, right? That, that theological or theoretical presuppositions and, and ideas weren't enough to convey the truth of the gospel. It ultimately had to become enfleshed in Jesus. In the person of Jesus, we have the meaning, we have the message, we have the messenger, all wrapped up in one. Well, church, that's what we're called to do. We're called to live this out. We're, we talk about this a lot of grace, that we're to be the living exegesis of the gospel. We're to be the sign and symbol, the practice and the people of how people encounter God, how the world sees and comes to understand what the good news is. And so we always have to be asking and practicing living that good news out as a people. This is a dynamic, deeply relational way of existing as a church. You see, Paul wasn't, he wasn't concerned with maintaining some kind of established order as he moved around the Mediterranean. No, he was setting fires that was actually burning off a lot of that, burning off the layers of accumulated power, privilege, perspective, to try to get to the floor where new expressions could flourish. But doing so in a way that also didn't allow the accumulation of those things to really destroy the foundational things, the good old growth of scripture, some of the traditions, some of the ways that this has been understood and practiced. Well, friends, 
we all live now in Thessalonica and Berea and Athens, all three at once. And while we may feel more comfortable in one type of situation, either coming in and stirring things up and then getting run out of town or going to that place where we're safe, where we can talk rationally and work through things and let things change slowly, or going to a totally different environment and trying to, <clears throat> excuse me, trying to translate things out differently. The truth is we're in all three, all at once, all the time. And as a church, we're called on that same mission as the early church was, as every church is, to bear witness, to light fires in all those places, not the fires that destroy, but the fires that burn away the culture, that hold on to that which is good and established and healthy, but burns away everything else to make room for new growth that allows for that freshness to come. We're called to go where we're opposed, where people don't want us. We're called to go where we're accepted. We're called to go to those places that are uncomfortable, that are totally foreign to us. They may not even know whether that they oppose it or accept it because they haven't encountered it. We're called to go where we speak the same language and where we have to translate, where we feel at home and where we feel foreign where we feel comfortable and where we feel challenged, where we feel we bring a depth of experience and where we feel like this is all brand new. We got to figure it out on the fly. Church, that is what we're called to, all of those things, all the time. And as Grace Church, y'all, we are uniquely positioned in this time and place to do this. I want to let that sink in. It's just so much is happening in our world. So much is happening to our community of believers that can seem challenging, can seem overwhelming, actually are working for our advantage. We are uniquely able to respond to these things. We have the opportunity, the capacity, the resources, the people, and the message to do this and do this well. As we emerge from this really unique period in our history, our personal history, I believe we're positioned to live into this mission of God more than we ever have been before. The question is, are we going to rise up and meet that? Are we going to let the mission of God form our imagination? the way it formed Paul's and Silas's and Jason's and all the first followers of Jesus. Are we going to pick up our flame to burn away the ages of stifling undergrowth so fresh expressions of the church can emerge? Or are we going to tend to our own little patch while the world continues to suffocate around us? That's the question we have, Grace Church, before us. That's the question I hope you'll ask in the reflections as you go through the reflections, the personal and growth and, and group reflections in the learning guide this week. You see, that's been done for us. God's answer, Jesus' answer was, yes, I'll do it. And he did. He laid aside everything, took on the form of a human, the ultimate interpretation of God to us, took on our form, and then lived the gospel before us. And a huge part of that was when he gathered all his disciples that night before he was crucified. And if you'll gather your elements, he did something very special. He said, I want you to remember this. Remember what? Well, remember why he came. Remember the mission. To give himself for us. To change our mind about God. To show us what God, who God truly is. To burn away the accumulated culture. To take away the transgression, the sin, the misinformation and show us clearly 
who God is. And that night he took it, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body. Take and eat. And likewise, he took the cup. He said, this is my blood poured out as a sign of the new covenant. Take and drink. So as we do this this morning, let's do this remembering the mission of God that came to give us these things. So take and eat and drink. Now, as Bailey leads us to some more worship, take this time to reflect. What do you need to do in response to this? Don't let the moment pass. Write it down, type it out, but commit to what God is revealing right now through the spirit, through the message, through the word. Also continue in worship through offering. The link will be there uh, to show you where to give. We give not just to give money, we give as an act of worship. It's symbolic that all of us have something to give and that none of us is without need. So we share our gifts. We do more than talk. We, we do something in response. So reflect, give your offering, worship. Thanks for being here this morning. Just seems to come out wrong Won't you help us, please help us Just to sing along A new redemption song A new redemption song Lord, we need A new redemption day all our worries keep getting in the way. Won't you help us, please help us find the words to pray to bring redemption day, to bring redemption day. Lord, we've tried, just seems to come out wrong. Won't you help us, please help us just to sing along a new redemption song, a new redemption song. And Lord, we need a new redemption day but all our worries keep getting in the way won't you help us please help us find the words to pray to bring redemption day to bring redemption day cause Lord we need a Redemption song Lord we've tried Just seems to come out wrong Won't you help us Please help us Just to sing along A new redemption song A new redemption song
God, my God, wherever I go, glory. Where I reap and where I sow, glory. When my hand it grips the thorns, glory. In the still and in the storm, glory. Glory. Oh, we labor unto glory till heaven and earth are one. Oh, we labor unto glory until God's kingdom comes. The sun it shines and then goes down. Glory, rain it pours and beats the ground. Glory, dust it blows and ends my days. Glory, hearts they burn beneath your gaze. Glory, glory. Oh, we labor unto glory till heaven and earth are one. Oh, we labor unto glory until God's kingdom comes. My heart, my hands, their kingdom bound. Glory. Where thorns no longer curse the ground, glory. Trim the wick and light the flame, glory. My work, it will not be in vain, glory, glory. Oh, we labor unto glory. Till heaven and earth are one Oh, we labor unto glory Until God's kingdom comes Oh, we labor unto glory Till heaven and earth are one Oh, we labor unto glory Until God's kingdom comes Until God's kingdom comes until God's kingdom comes. Hi Grace, today's benediction comes to you from the jogging trail just off campus and it's brought to you by a letter Paul wrote to the Thessalonians. Um, he wrote, be at peace among yourselves. And we urge you, sisters and brothers, to admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. See that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seeks to do good to one another and to everyone. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies, but test everything. Hold fast to what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. And now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Amen. My God, my God, wherever I go, glory. Where I reap and where I sow, glory. When my hand it grips the thorn, glory in the still and in the storm glory glory oh we labor unto glory till heaven and earth are one oh we labor unto glory until God's kingdom comes
the sun it shines and then goes down glory rain it pours and beats the ground glory dust it blows and ends my days glory hearts they burn beneath your gaze glory glory oh we labor unto glory till heaven and earth are one oh we labor unto glory until god's kingdom comes My heart, my hands, their kingdom bound. Glory, where thorns no longer curse the ground. Glory, trim the wick and light the flame. Glory, my work, it will not be in vain. Glory. Glory, oh, we labor unto glory till heaven and earth are one. Oh, we labor unto glory until God's kingdom comes. Oh, we labor unto glory till heaven and earth are one. Oh, we labor unto glory. Until God's kingdom comes, until God's kingdom comes, until God's kingdom comes.